So, okay, guys, welcome to this uh, Aromatized Wine uh, 101 uh, in this new uh, interesting, intriguing setup. I hope you will be able to enjoy it. This one is a, is a weird one in a way because this is a tasting uh, uh, seminar. There is an important tasting component to it, and I'm not used to giving tasting over the internet, not knowing what you guys are drinking, but we'll try to make the best out of it. Aromatized, aromatized wine is a very vast subject, so there's a lot of stuff we'll have to go uh, through in, in, in just the one hour uh, we have uh, for this, so I hope everything uh, is uh, doing all right. First, I need to um, thank the, the Tales of the Cocktail Foundation for, for, uh, for setting this up. I know it's been a huge challenge for them to, uh, to put together uh, uh, Tales of the Cocktail in, in the current circumstances. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, trusting me with the seminar and thanks a lot for all the good hard work they've been doing uh, for the cocktail uh, industry uh, this year. Um, and also thanks to uh, Martini for sponsoring this, uh, this, uh, this um, one on one seminar uh, and, and trying to further the education around aromatized wine even though we're not going to talk only about Martini products. Uh, so thanks a lot for your, uh, for your ongoing support. Uh, my name is uh, François Monti. Uh, I've written extensively about vermouth. I wrote a book in Spanish about, about, about vermouth, and I've studied aromatized wine in general uh, over the last few years. Uh, you've got right now up on the screen my details if you want to contact me, my website, and my Twitter, Instagram. I'm not sure you can live tweet and live Instagram this year, but, you know, uh, whatever, if you want to take a photo of your computer and, and, and uh, send this over, this is great. Um, so let's dive right in. As I said, we don't have a lot of time, so let's dive, dive right in. And, and uh, before we talk even about the prehistory of aromatized wine, I want to talk about one specific aromatized wine, uh, because I think this will give us a very good idea of why and how aromatized wine uh, were born, and this is what you have on the screen right now, which is uh, resonated wines. Um, those are not very popular uh, right now, but you probably be aware of them if 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 you've if you've had if you've been to have a, a Greek food at a Greek restaurant, or if you've uh, been lucky enough to go to Greece uh, on holiday and have one of those fresh, uh, you know, white rosé, weird but weird tasting wine that that Greek people do tend to drink and uh, that we enjoy so much when it is in that exotic setting and, and vacation. And, and those, one are, those wines are resonated, which means that they're made with, with the, uh, the sap of, of they're regular grape wine, but they're feathered, aromatized with the sap of, 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 uh, of a specific type of pine from the Mediterranean, the, the Aleppo pine. If you sort of look into resonated wine, you will see that people are saying, this is a traditional wine from Greece, as I've just said, and they've been doing it for more than 2000 years. Actually, uh, apparently they've been doing it for 7,000 years. So Patrick McGovern is an archeologist who studied wine and beers and how uh, humanity discovered and, and when start, they started to make those, those style of drinks. And he analyzes uh, a lot of old amphora that he thought maybe, you know, uh, stored wine. And the oldest one they have is from 7,000 years ago in, in what is now Iran. And they found out that that amphora stuck wine, but also that there was another component to it that's probably resina, so that tree sap uh, that you can see on, on, on the screen there. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting one. The oldest wine amphora we have was actually an aromatized wine. And, and one of the uh, things that McGovern wanted to investigate it and wanted to know was why would they do this? Why would they put something else into, into wine? And his hypothesis is, is, is very interesting in the sense that probably they saw that uh, those people in the Near East, in the Middle East, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 years ago, realized that uh, when you uh, cut one of those trees and you've got the sap and the sap is something that actually cures uh, the tree. So they thought if it's good for the tree, maybe it's good for us. And they started to try and use that sap uh, as a medicine. But how do you administer medicine, especially sap, something that's sticky, something that, that, that gets uh, very fast, solid very fast. Well, one of the uh, easiest way to do that was to mix it with wine. 
Uh, another hypothesis is that because those clay amphora uh, were not hermetic, they would let a lot of oxygen in, a lot of those wines would turn bad very fast. At, at that time, there was no way to keep wine good for, uh, for, for a long time. It would go off in two, three weeks, a month, maybe if you were lucky. And so uh, the uh, people in antique uh, Greece or in, 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 in the Near East, in Iran, uh, what they would use that resina to uh, seal uh, the amphora and to make it uh, impermeable, impermeable to, to oxygen. And so the wine would keep for longer. But obviously, because you put such a flavorful, such a piney uh, sort of uh, substance to, 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 to seal your amphora, a lot of that is going to come through into the wine. And so the wine is going to be to have that flavor, right? So none of those two reasons we've just mentioned have anything to do with taste. But the thing is, true exposure is the same way that, for example, bitter ingredients in something that we don't like. We don't like the, the flavor of bitterness, uh, but we get used to it. I mean, we don't like it naturally, but we get used to it. And, and at one point, we'll start having uh, slamming shots of, of Fernet, for example, which is extremely bitter. Uh, this is not natural, but this is something that true exposure we get used to and we start loving. Maybe some of the same thing happens with those wines. You put resina, you put sap into your wine or to... Uh, to um, uh, seal the amphoras and uh, the flavor it imparts is something that at first is weird and then you start enjoying it. And that's why 7,000 years later, the Greeks still drink that sort of stuff. So uh, that's what I call the pure, pure history of aromatized wine. Uh, uh, the domestication of grape, grapevine uh, started around eight to 6,000 years ago. And as I've just uh, commented, we see that in uh, 5,000 years, uh, seven, sorry, the domestication of grapevine uh, started uh, 10 to 8,000 years ago. And as I've just commented, the oldest wine residue we have is from 7,000 years ago, and it was already an aromatized uh, wine. A lot of the first aromatized wine were not so simple as the one I just described, the Redzina and wine and that's it, right? A lot of it was basically human being trying to understand what was going on with fermentation because before that, what it was is, is uh, they would find uh, fermented fruits, uh, but they would not ferment themselves. They would uh, eat the fermented fruit and like what they would get from it, right? And so when they started trying and uh, mastering the art of fermentation, they didn't really know what was going on. So a lot of the time, what they would do is use those fruits they know fermented very well and start throwing together with them uh, other ingredients, other herbs they knew were good for this or that. And uh, so the first fermented wines, the first fermented uh, beverages, alcohol beverage, were actually sort of cocktails of herbs, roots, and fruits, right? So why do we aromatize wine? There are historically three fundamental reasons, and I think the Ritzina st story um, tells that story. One was conservation. So Ritzina helped to keep the wine in, 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 in a better state. You could, you could drink it for longer. But uh, it was not all only about amphoras and sealing them. Uh, human beings realized very soon that some substance in nature, some botanicals, would also be helping. Like, for example, if, if you are a beer drinker, you know that hops are uh, the conservative uh, of beer. And so hops were added to wine, but also uh, 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 a botanical such as wormwood, which is uh, the core botanical of vermouth, one of the wine we will be discussing later on. Uh, obviously, um, um, wormwood has a, a, a conservative aspect to it. It's good to uh, keep a wine or beer, and so it would be thrown uh, into wine uh, very early. There's also the medicinal aspect to it. Again, with Resina, we saw it. I mean, they realized that maybe there was something good in the sap. And the same happened to a lot of other botanicals where, you know, you would use herbs uh, to, to cure yourself. We were not, we were not about, uh, it was not about a big company making uh, pharmaceutical uh, um, medicines uh, as we have right now, obviously. So you would work with what you have around and herbs was obviously folks medicine, what we call folks medicine today. Uh, well, you would infuse them in wine or in beer because uh, water was not really good back then. And that's one of the ways uh, you would administer those medication through wine. Uh, there's a third component to, to, do, to aromatization and why we would do that. And that's got to do with ritualistic or religious uh, 
uh, reasons, which I'm not going to go uh, into today, but obviously played a part in us being familiar with, with aromatized drinks. And of course, none of those have got to do with taste, but as I said, you know, you get used to those drinks and then all of a sudden what you have is, is you develop a taste for the stuff, right? And the best example that I could get for, you know, developing the, the taste for the stuff, well, uh, it's an aromatized wine we're not gonna drink uh, today, which is called Rincan Quin. It's, it's from the south of France. It's fairly new. It's, it was born in the 80s and basically it's what we call a peach leaf wine. Um, it's peach leaf, but it's actually made with fruit also, not only with the leaf of, of, uh, of peach. Um, this brand specifically it was born in the 80s, but we know of peach leaf wine since at least the 16th or the 15th century, and there were probably much older ones. Uh, this, this was probably first done because uh, peach and other fruits were not, were not available of consumption yet along. You would have a very short uh, period of time where it was in season and and those flavors were the flavors you were craving all through the year so one of the way to keep that flavor and be able to have access to the flavor of peach um when peaches on peaches are not around is just to infuse it in wine okay and uh obviously uh some that 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 taste prevailed and we still have it today in in, in form of soft, some aromatized fruit wines um it's probably also the history of, of sangria and blue wine. A lot of the wines we're enjoying at specific, uh, in specific countries or specific time of the year uh, also are in a way aromatized wines and, and were probably also derived from, from this, this uh, well, willingness of human being, of course, to get drunk, uh, uh, but also uh, to sort of get those flavors that represent like a time, a season, uh, uh, a moment in their life and, and celebrate them. Um, so as, I've, as we've already seen, uh, human be beings have basically always uh, aromatized their wines. Uh, some people actually are saying that because the oldest uh, wine residue we have is aromatized wine, people drank aromatized wine before they drank wine. Of course, it's a bit absurd, but there is truth to it in the sense that as soon as wine was produced, it got aromatized. Um, uh, up there now on the screen, you have to, I mean, not the, not the main responsible for this, but, but at least a good representative of two of the civilizations that were really responsible for, uh, for our, um, uh, the development of, of aromatized wine culture and our deep love of it today, uh, thousands of years later. On the left, you know, it's always the Greeks or the, uh, the Italians when we're talking about uh, Western culture and, and, and Western civilizations and food stuff and, 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 and wine. Uh, on the left, we have, um, we have Hippocrates, uh, who, who was, uh, of course, the father of Greek medicine, which means the father of Western medicine. And uh, some have credited him as the inventor of vermouth. That is not the case. He never, ever uh, worked with a mixture of wine and wormwood, which is what vermouth is. Uh, but he did indeed uh, prescribe, and a lot of other Greek doctors, that mixture of wine and, and, and different botanicals uh, as, as a medicine. And because that Greek culture was so essential to, 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 to uh, the medicine of Europe for centuries and centuries and centuries uh, that he would uh, prescribe that sort of treatment, uh, of course, had a huge impact on, on, on our uh, Western civilization attitude towards aromatized wine. This is something that we've always thought was good for us. Um, the other guy there is Apicius, which is, uh, Apicius is not the, uh, the author, but his name is, is, is on the covers, so to speak, of the only uh, Roman cookery book we have from antique Rome from, from the early years of the empire, which is the first century after Christ. Um, and in his book, he's got aromatized wine. And why is it important and significant? It's because this is taking the wine from the medicine world and moving it to the gastronomical world. Because in the first century um, uh, after Christ, uh, there was enough wealth in the Roman world so that not the middle class, there was no such thing as a middle class, but at least people could go and enjoy uh, enough food to go to not go hungry. So 
uh, when you're not going angry and when you have leisure time, that's, that's when you start to want to have something that uh, for many people at the time sounded weird, which is drinking uh, stuff either to uh, open up your appetite, so aperitivo, the verse of the aperitivo, or on the contrary, to ease with digestion, which are digestive. Like that's when, uh, because people had enough money to enjoy that uh, sort of uh, culture, that Dolce Vita, uh, 2000 years before la Dolce Vita, um, that's, that, that's when we see this as a leisure drink, a lifestyle choice already, like aromatized wine is a lifestyle choice. But obviously because the Romans liked this lifestyle so much, they got soft. Well, that's what some commentators said at the time. And the uh, Roman Empire uh, disappeared. And with it, that culture of, of having uh, those um, aromatized wines for leisure. So for centuries, uh, it was all about safekeeping the Greek tradition of aromatized wine as medicine, and that happened in monasteries throughout Europe. They, they, they reproduced all those recipes from Greek medicine and, and administered it to sick people. So for centuries, we had, as I just said, for centuries, we had, we had medicine in monasteries, uh, but there was, only, there, was, there was still one class, at least one class of people that were able to enjoy aromatized wine as something more than medicine, as, as like a lifestyle choice, something to sort of say, hey, here is who I am, and I've got more money than you have, and I can have this, and you, you don't, or they could have guests and show them, look how rich I am. And those people were, of course, the aristocrats. And uh, their, their drug of choice, their aromatized wine of choice at the time was called, was, uh, called Hippocras. Because of the name, people think it comes from the Greek uh, medicine from, from Hippocrates. That is not the case at all. Hippocras was invented in the 12th or 13th uh, uh, century. It was a core drink for one very good reason, is because Hippocras were spice wines. Uh, so there are no major brands producing it today. You can still find it in Europe. Uh, sometimes like some people want to uh, reproduce uh, drinks from the past, and, but it's very, very, very small scale. You see some bars, though, who are making their own homemade hippocras and sort of use it instead of other aromatized wines, such as vermouth in their drinks, in their, in their, in their cocktails. Um, um, Hippocrates, so historically Hippocrates was 100% spices, uh, so you, you had no herbs, you had no roots, you had no uh, aromatic herbs, nothing. Everything was made with, with spices that were coming from, from the Far East or from, the, from India, from Indonesia, from China. Uh, those spices were obviously extremely expensive, uh, they, they were coming all the way from Asia. Uh, think about that. People say that in the 14th century, nutmeg, a gram of nutmeg, uh, cost the same as one gram of gold. It's insane when you think of it. I think of it anytime I'm I'm, I'm putting nutmeg on a drink or in mashed mashed potatoes. I'm like, I, this is actually this used to be gold. Um, and, and so when you would uh, put wine, um, uh, sorry, put spices into wine, you, you would put cinnamon, you put ginger, you put uh, grains of paradise, you would put nutmeg, you, you would put clove and infuse it in wine. It, that was a lot of money in that, in, that, in that wine, right? And it was a way to say, this is who I am, I have a lot of money, this is my stitches drink of the time, right? Um, Hippocrates, uh, well, as you can see this, <laughs> because some people were very rich, they were drinking too much of the stuff and they had the same, the same issue that we still have today that you can see on 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 the on the screen, it's you know uh, be be responsible and don't drink too much stuff. Now it's it's not as expensive as it used to be, but you know you still need to do the responsible drinking, and and be careful with what you put in your body. Um, Hippocrates is also very important for the later development of what I call modern uh, aromatized wines, just such as vermouth, because as we will uh, as I will. Uh, mentioned in a few uh, in a few minutes uh, at the end of the day what is modern vermouth if, if not a, a mixture of of those uh, medicinal wines made with uh, in this case wormwood and the 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 the, uh, the culture of uh, expensive spice wine uh, the spices got cheaper in the 18th and 19th century so they became affordable but they were still very desirable because of what they symbolized throughout centuries and so putting those two things together, uh, wormwood wines or medicinal wines uh, from monasteries with spice wines 
from the chords, if you put those things together, what you have is, 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 is modern vermouth. But I don't want to speak too much about vermouth uh, today because I, I, I think um, uh, one of the unknown wines, it's a wine, it's an aromatized wine you know, but probably maybe you don't know the richness of its history. And that's what I want to focus on, just to give an example of, of, of the development of those drinks and, and how they, they got so popular uh, is, is um, Kinkina's wines, wines made with uh, cinchona bark. Uh, you may have heard uh, a lot about the history of, of Kinkina, of, of cinchona, because of course, uh, this is also what aromatizes our tonic that we, uh, that we drink with our gin and tonics. Uh, still, I think it's worth it to go uh, over this uh, uh, a little bit because you will see part of the same process I described for Wizina wine or other type of aromatized wine playing out. Right. So as, as I described the history of, of, of Cinchona and how it came to aromatize wine, you will see again some of the stuff we commented before on Retina or other type of, of early aromatized wines. Uh, because of course, a lot of the aromatized wines we know are made with ingredients that uh, are Greeks uh, for fathers, as uh, I can say, as, as a, a European. Uh, already knew, but there's a lot of stuff that also came afterwards that they didn't know. And one of those ingredients that we didn't know in Europe was cinchona. Cinchona is, is a native from, from the Andes, uh, from, from, from the mountains of, of South America, from, from Peru and Bolivia, what, is, what are now Peru and, and, and Bolivia. And as the story goes, uh, Jesuits monks, which the Spaniards send uh, with, with their uh, conquistadores, uh, noticed that um, native population uh, would, when they were having a fever, they would, they would, they would uh, use, uh, do an infusion with bark of a local tree and that the, 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 the fever would subside. Um, there was no malaria in, in, in South America, but there was a big problem with malaria, malaria in Europe. Uh, you may not know that, but actually there were still a lot of problems with malaria in the south of Europe until the 1960s. So it's still a very recent uh, problem. And there was no natural remedy for malaria at all in Europe. Uh, so they sent those parks back, uh, back to Europe uh, because they thought maybe it will help. Uh, they, what they didn't know is that they had found the only um, natural remedy existing on the whole planet uh, against uh, uh, malaria, and they found it thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers from where malaria was a real, real problem. But yeah, you get the bark, and then you can turn it into powder. Uh, but how do you drink it? How, how, how do you how do you get this into your body? Uh, you you will not mix it with water. Water was not safe, and people thought water was actually dangerous. Uh, if, even if, even clean water was thought to be dangerous in the in the fifteenth and 16th century. And so naturally, naturally, uh, apothecaries and, and doctors of the time, and even quacks, I mean, uh, not, not, not everyone selling remedies was a, a real doctor back then, uh, started mixing that powder uh, with wine. And to make it a bit more uh, enjoyable, uh, you would also add uh, maybe a bit of sugar or other ingredients. One of the most famous uh, producers of, of that uh, remedy against those fevers, uh, the malaria, uh, in the 16th century, the, the, the man who made it popular in, 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 in the UK, in the United Kingdom, uh, Robert Talbor, um, mixed it with uh, wine and lemon and uh, roses leaves. So uh, you already have an interesting aromatized wine right there. And right then, maybe it's a cocktail, Maybe it's an aromatized wine. It's some, somewhere in between, right? And, and um, so very early quinquinas and wine uh, were uh, uh, an extraordinary match. And, and, and for, for centuries, the only way to sort of relieve those fevers uh, was to, to drink precisely this, a mixture of, uh, of, of uh, the powder of cinchona bark and, and, uh, and wine. And so in the 19th century, uh, when the aromatized wine industry starts to really get very, very strong and very important uh, in, in Europe, uh, one of the most popular style of aromatized wine, uh, you had vermouth 
uh, and you had Kinkina wines, as you can see here on the, the poster for Saint Raphael, which is a, an old French brand that still exists today. Uh, it was uh, something that was uh, sold as um, hygienic, as they say in French, hygienical, which means it's, it's good for your health. It's a tonic drink, which means that it's good against a lot of problems that you can have and will uh, put you in a, in a, in a better place uh, health-wise. And on this, uh, on this post poster that you can see, you see that there is a strong, they make a clear opposition between absinthe, which was already thought in the late 1900s as a bad and dangerous spirit, and a, a drink such as kinkina. Uh, and indeed, uh, of all the aromatized wine that were born in the 19th century, as an evolution from the medicine world into uh, lifestyle choices, lifestyle drinks, uh, Kinkina is the one that still could say we're actually very enjoyable, it's really good, you, you, you can enjoy those drinks, but it's actually medicine, it's actually good for your body, uh, which, which, which explains its very long uh, popularity. Uh, okay. So Kinkinas uh, were still very popular after the Second World War when the, the vermouth world were already going into decline and other aromatized wine were even disappearing. Kinkinas remained popular precisely because they could still say, hey, this is, this is good for your health, because everyone knew Sinchon Navarre was still something uh, very, very healthy. So uh, there was not the same uh, pushback against those aromatized wine, kinkinas, as again others that could not make any more of those, those medicinal claims. But let's not fool ourselves. Uh, if aromatized wines got so big, it's because they got so good. Uh, they got out of the medicinal world and into uh, the, uh, they became sort of lifestyle choices because people could enjoy them on cafes. As you can see there, the one there is a, 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 a French uh, cafe outside drinking, you know, patio drinking. Uh, uh, so French and uh, as I've heard, like slowly getting very American too with a lot of American cities allowing uh, sidewalk drinking now. Um, uh, or the other, the other drawing is from uh, the Carpano Cafe uh, in, in, in Italy, one of the big in Turin where, where vermouth culture was born. Uh, if, if those drinks were restricted to uh, apothecaries or, or uh, monasteries, they would never have sold as much as they did. They would not, you would not have brands making, becoming such marketing powerhouse. And all that happened in 19th century. Uh, um, those drinks, of course, as I said, were sold because they were supposedly good for your body. But uh, you can see in the style of drinks that you have, uh, that it's not, it's not only about having uh, kinkina and a bit of lemon and a, and, and a bit of roses to sort of make it palatable. It gets, uh, those formulas get very, very complex with a lot of ingredients to make it something really enjoyable that you can have uh, as an aperitivo to open uh, up uh, your, your appetite. This, of course, goes hand in hand with, the, with, the, with economical, uh, economical growth. And so when, when those drinks got big, uh, because of course, uh, for example, vermouth is something that became uh, important in the US when cocktail bartenders started using it. We'll talk about it a bit later. Uh, but in Europe, when those drinks got big, uh, very little, no one basically, or very few people knew about cocktails. So um, how did we drink this? Uh, um, how did we drink this in Europe? Well, there were basically two ways. One is the Italian way, and one is the French way. In both cases, you would, you would drink it with soda or with cells, because uh, obviously in the 19th century, um, you would not have ice drinks, or you would have very little ice. Uh, ice was still a rarity, uh, especially in Europe. And so you still need di uh, dilution uh, and a bit of freshness into it. So you would add, you would take a vermouth, you would take a kinkina, you would take any kind of aromatized wine and add soda in it, in sort of what we would call today spritz or riffs on the Americano. So you would take your aromatized wine, maybe put a bit of uh, extra bitter in it uh, through uh, an aromatized uh, spirit, uh, you know, like bitters or fernet or stuff like that. And then you would put some water into it. That would be the Italian way. The French way, a bit more on the sweet side. So the Italian went the bitter way and, and the, uh, the, the French would go the, 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 the fruity and, and, and sweet and sugary way because they would also have cells, but they would mix it also quite often with syrup or with liquors. So for example, vermouth was drunk, uh, vermouth cassis, which is with creme de cassis, like a black currant uh, liquor. 
uh, and uh, so a bit of that and and then and then dry vermouth or you could also use uh strawberry liqueurs lemon syrup things like that you know just to add a, a, a bit more flavor and tone down the natural bitterness of aromatized wine because all those aromatized wines were made with bitter ingredients uh, as we will uh, see in a moment when we go to the tasting part of the uh, of, of, of the uh, the seminar so those uh, way of drinking uh, uh, aromatized wines I think are interesting to bring back today. Uh, we, we roll into like low alcohol, aperitivo culture, but we're still a lot of the time thinking in, in, in cocktail uh, terms, right? Um, this is very interesting, I think, to go back to, to the roots of, of how those drinks were served uh, in their home countries. A lot of, of the, that type of serve has disappeared. In France, it's very difficult to find the Vermouth Cassis anymore. Uh, but those are really delightful drinks, and I think they fit totally with, with what are the, the trends on the market today. So if you, have, if you don't know them, I really uh, encourage you to research those drinks and start mixing them. They're very, very easy to, to drink, very easy to mix, very easy to drink, and very, very enjoyable. Um, eh, let's, let's start with the, uh, let's start with the, uh, the, the tasting part. Um, uh, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, under medication at the moment. I can't taste with you guys, but you know, uh, I know the products. So uh, because we've talked about it, I think we're going to start with the Kinkina. Uh, and uh, I suggested various references. I don't know which one you have at home with you right now. One of the, the, the one I mentioned was the Cap Mati, uh, which is an old a, uh, Corsican uh, so from France, uh, Kinkina, it's white, the, the base is white wine. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about how, how all this stuff is done. It's Mistel based, this one. So, uh, normally you do, you do your, your Kinkinas with your, with, with Mistels, uh, which are basically you take the grape juice, you press the grape juice, you don't let it ferment to become wine. What you do is you add alcohol to, to, to the grape juice so it doesn't ferment. And so you keep the natural sugar from the fruit uh, and the, the alcohol is brought by that uh, distillate that you added to it. And that, that makes for a, 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 like a richer sort of, uh, of, of, of uh, aromatized wine because you get all the natural uh, sugar from the fruits. Um, so the French, the quinquina, obviously because uh, malaria was such a problem all over Southern Europe, Basically, all countries uh, in the south of Europe have had those. So you have quinquinas in France, but if you move to Italy, you have Barolo Quinato, or you have even have Vermut Quinato, so we, we aromatized wine with, with, with cinch on the bark. I think even in Greece, they had some. In Spain, they had a, a, a thing called Quina San Clemente, which is a sweet wine with, with cinch on the bark. They used to give that to kids until the 1960s, which is crazy when we think about it, but it was marketed for kids uh, through comics. Uh, and, and toys. Even in Portugal, uh, they used to make uh, uh, cinchona bark in shoes port. Uh, so it's all through Europe. But what you're tasting right now, if you're tasting a Matei, is like really the French style, uh, which is going to be, uh, in this sense, very fruity, actually, um, uh, very fresh and citrusy. So cinchona, what's interesting with cinchona is that you will you may note bitterness in the middle of your palate it's it's uh it's uh, sorry it's at the back of the palate it's quite uh quite drying so if you have, if you have like that sugar in your mouth but then it's dry at the end that's because it's it's uh cinchona um and, and a bit spicy uh, it's it's very pleasant i really like a cinchona in aromatized wine precisely because aromatized wine tend to have a lot of sugar and so the cinchona dries it up and it makes you ready for more obviously if what you have is not cap mate but something like beer which is which is a red style of quinquina french wines uh, it's it's also fruity but it's not fresh it's more fruitiness that's more towards cherries um, and a bit deeper, a bit more, it reminds you of port, maybe. And if you go towards the Italian Quinato, and what you have is a Barolo Quinato, then you will have more uh, notes of coffee, chocolate, things like that. So it's, it's a very wide gamut of, of profile, uh, because there was not one uh, aromatized, uh, um, quinine, citrona aromatized wine profile. It was, it was not about 
a flavor profile. It was about delivering uh, um, a medicine. Uh, another one that I didn't put on the list, but history tea was a cinchona aromatized uh, wine was a lilette, and lilette is all about the fruit, all about the freshness, really cut down. It's as far as, uh, from medicine as you can get and still be a, a, a cinchona aromatized uh, wine. So in what sort of cocktails can we use those drinks? It's complicated. There, there, is a, a very, there are very few uh, classic cocktails with those uh, quinquina uh, wines. Uh, they only made it into the, the, the U.S. as a cocktail ingredient in 1900, 1910, but not, they were not really popular with cocktail bartenders. It's only uh, when, you got to, when cocktails get big in Europe in the 1920s that you see them being used. And in those cases, well, you have the classic cocktails made with Lilette, which is, uh, you know, you have the, ver the Vesper or the Cops Reviver, uh, uh, number two. By the way, a lot of people are saying Lilette used to be much more bitter uh, before and so when you're creating those cocktails then you should go towards quinquinas and have that lingering bitterness at the end that that has disappeared from that product uh, as far as i can say that was never true uh, lilette was never very very bitter probably more bitter than it is today but it was never extremely bitter so be careful what you what you hear about those historical uh, style of aromatized wine let's move to the second tasting uh, so go ahead uh, don't wait for me uh, and we're just basically tasting, you, you could have Martini Rosso, you can have Cocky, you can have uh, other uh, of the, the, the vermouth I recommended. Basically what we're tasting is the historical style of, of vermouth, the one that, that really became major hit in the, 19th, uh, in the 18th century, in, uh, sorry, in the 19th century, in, in, in Italy first, then in France, and then moved to the US and was discovered by, by, by uh, cocktail uh, bartenders. This is the world's best known style of vermouth. This is what we call Rosso vermouth today. And as I said before, this is uh, wormwood. The aromatizing ingredient is wormwood. Wormwood is bitter and aromatic at the same time. Um, it's difficult to say exactly what you need to look for in terms of, of identifying the flavor of wormwood. It's abaceous, maybe sometimes people uh, mistake it for oregano. The bitterness is also difficult to say because cinchona, you notice cinchona on the back palate, but um, wormwood is front and medium, so it's, it's all the whole mouth. So it's, it's, it's difficult to tell you this is, this is where wormwood is. But what you will get in the vermouth you're tasting, whatever the vermouth it is you're tasting, you will get a lot of orange, citrusy note, orange in, in, in quite often, a lot of uh, Mediterranean herbs like oregano or, or, or rosemary and uh, warm spices such as cinnamon or, or cloves, uh, vanilla, uh, sometimes chocolatey notes. For the more bitter ones, you'll get a lot of uh, herbaceous, eucalyptus or even balsamic uh, notes, very complex drinks, very interesting for cocktails. That's why it, it got so, so popular in, in, in cocktails. And the, the vermouth you have right now aren't really far removed from medicine because they become a, 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 a friendly drink, something you really were drinking to enjoy yourself. It's really no need for me to go over what are the drinks that you can mix with those uh, Manhattan Negronis. I mean, sweet vermouth is such uh, like the workhorse of, of classic cocktails that you all know many, many cocktails made uh, famous with those with that style of aromatized wine. I wanted to, to bring out a second style of vermouth because while the Italians uh, created sweet vermouth, when the French created their own take on vermouth, they went another way totally, which was, which was the, uh, the, the way of the dry uh, vermouth. So go ahead and, and taste. You could have a Noyer Prat, maybe you have a Dolan Dry, or maybe you have a Spanish way of, of making dry vermouth, which is Timbal Dry, uh, invented by the French, as I say, perfected by the French, because I think there are exceptions to this, but generally the best dry vermouth is still made in France uh, today. And you'll see it's, it's, it's not an easy style of vermouth to drink on its own. Uh, it's, it's not very bitter, but it's ebaceous, it's got chamomile notes, it's got a bit of a dryness to it. That's not only due to the fact that there is less sugar in it, but also uh, because of the gentian they use, because of the, the quinine they use. Um, it's, it's drying, right? And probably that's why the French never actually drank it alone. As I said before, they used to put uh, a fruit liquors or a bit of syrup in it to liven it up. So they wanted to, to put what was missing from the bottle, maybe they put it, they added it to, to, to have it as an aperitivo. Obviously, uh, the, the dry vermouth or the dry martini, right? Like I think probably 90% of, 
of all the dry vermouth in the world uh, goes into goes into goes into mal dry martinis. It's, it's it's crazy, but it's very interesting vermouth to play around with, and you can create a lot of interesting cocktails with it. All right, uh, before uh, going further with, with the uh, with the uh, the other aromatized wine, I want you to taste today. Uh, we've seen the star style because I really think if we're talking aromatized wine, it's always vermouth and quinquinas that we're going to think about. So very quickly, all those all those those drinks are made. So first, you have your botanicals because yes, uh, vermouth is made with wormwood. Yes, uh, quinquinas are, are made with uh, cinchona bark uh, um, uh, extract. Um, but you also have a lot of other ingredients. We've mentioned citruses, we've mentioned uh, spices, etc. So all those ingredients, uh, you need to uh, put them into the wine. And what you don't normally do is actually, there are exceptions to this, but normally you don't infuse them into the wine. Most producers, what they would do is extract them in alcohol. You have a uh, hydroalcoholic uh, mix, uh, probably 50% alcohol, and you let, you let all those bot botanical rest until you have an extract that is extremely intense. And normally one or two centiliters of that extract is enough to flavor, to aromatize one liter of wine. So of course, because we're talking about aromatized wine, that extract, once you have it, you have to mix it with wine, uh, always. Uh, but it can be normal, regular wine, normally white wine. In the case of vermouth, most of the time, not always, it's made with white wine that's then colored. Uh, or, or mistel, as I, uh, we mentioned mistel before in the case of quinquinas, but some vermouth are also made with mistel. So if, if you don't remember, uh, mistel is actually grape juice that you don't let ferment. You add, instead of, of letting all the grape juice, uh, the, the sugar transform into alcohol, you add alcohol to it before fermentation starts. So what you have, it's high in alcohol, a bit higher than wine in general, but you, have, you still have all the natural sugar of the fruit. And, and so that helps create a product which has much more, a lot of body, and you don't need to add sugar to it because you already have the natural sugar from the fruit. Uh, and that, and those mistels are sometimes made with white, as, as if it were white wine or red wine. So, so in the case of beer, for example, the, quinqu the, the, the French quinquina, um, it's red, but it's not unlike uh, red style vermouth. It's not colored with caramel. It's the natural color of the wine. Okay. Um, so if you make it with mistel, you don't need to add sugar. But if you if you if you make it with wine, and most of the time you will add you add, you will add uh, sugar to it. If uh, uh, most aromatized wine will also be fortified with a neutral spirit, it can be neutral grain, it can be neutral cereal, it can be neutral. Uh, beetroot, uh, distillate, whatever, it, it really doesn't matter as long as it's neutral, it's just to bring uh, the, the alcohol level up. And as I said before, if you're making it with white wine, but I'm going to call it rosso, as is the case of, of vermouth, uh, but you, you will have to color it and you will do that with burnt sugar or, or, or caramel. So that's, that's, how, that's how the stuff is made. It's not very complicated. Uh, on the paper, but obviously the, the, the complicated thing is the balance between all those botanicals and the wine and the sugar to make it a delightful drink. That's where the secret is. Uh, obviously, there are laws and regulations, and uh, in Europe we have loads of those because those products are traditional European products. I've uh, put the most relevant bits uh, up on the screen. Uh, and there are some interesting uh, things to keep in mind for drinkers uh, and, and for uh, aromatized wine enthusiasts. Uh, one of which is that at least 75% of an aromatized wine needs to be that grape vine product. So the wine, the mistel, that needs to be 75% minimum. It can be more, but it has to be 75% minimum uh, of wine. You can add alcohol, you can add colors, as we've already seen. You can uh, sweeten it if uh, your base is not already naturally sweet. And in terms of alcohol, and that's why you, you see that a lot of it is fortified, it's minimum 14.5 uh, alcohol by volume, so much more than most wines, uh, and maximum 20, 20, uh, 22 uh, percent. That's the rules in, 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 in Europe. It doesn't apply all over the world, of course, but because most of those brands are made in Europe, well, it, it's, it's pretty near universal. The law also makes differences between different types of aromatized wine. You have uh, vermouth up there, 
but they also talk about quinquinas and two other songs which we are going to see right now. Uh, one is Bitter Vino, which has to be uh, flavored uh, with, uh, with um, gentian, okay? Well, gentian is an ingredient you will find in, in, in most vermouth, in most quinquinas also. Uh, but it's, it's that the only saying that if you are going to call it a bitter, you know, the main one would be uh, gentian. And gentian is the most bitter natural uh, botanical on earth. Uh, and uh, if uh, cinchona uh, was uh, the bitterness at the end of the palate and wormwood was more at the beginning, um, gentian is more like mid palate sort of uh, bitterness. And the last one is Americano, which is a mix between Wormwood and Gentian. We'll, we'll taste it in a minute, and I will tell you a bit more about the name, which is quite intriguing, and how it came to be. Uh, yeah, well, I think that's just what we're going to do right now. I think we, we're going to taste the Americano. Uh, that's the number four. There are not many Americano brands on the market. It's, it's, Americano used to be very popular, but, but it lost a lot of ground. And the, the brand I suggested you pour, Coqui Americano, is probably one that's the better known uh, today. And it's, it's its own category today. We, we think like we have aromatized wine, we have vermouth, we have pinquinas, and we have Americano. But actually, historically, that's not the way it was. And a lot of that has been said. People say, for example, that the, the name Americano is actually coming from uh, uh, an Italian word for uh, uh, bitter. Um, and I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think uh, at the end of the 19th century, actually, a lot of uh, Italian consumers got bored with just ordering regular vermouth. They just, they didn't want vermouth anymore. They wanted vermouth with stuff in it. And by stuff, it could mean you could go to a bar and ask, to a cafe, more than a bar, to an Italian cafe and ask them, uh, I want my uh, vermouth with uh, vanilla liquor. I want my vermouth with a bit of Amaro in it. I want my vermouth with a bit of Barolo in it, right? And one of the ways uh, people were drinking it was they wanted vermouth American style. What did it mean? They actually, what they wanted is vermouth as it was prepared and served in the United States, which was a cocktail. So you'd have vermouth cocktails in the United States, which was vermouth with drops of bitters, bitters, aromatic bitters like Angus to bitters, which most of them were actually uh, very much flavored with gentian. So what they were asking in those Italian cafe was vermouth with a bit of uh, an extra gentian kick. And because th that style of surf became so popular, uh, brands started bottling it, and Coqui was one of the pioneers. And uh, that's, that's how it became a style of its own. Uh, Americano, for me, is a style of vermouth. It's not a different style of aromatized wine. But the market success it had made it a beast of its own. And so if you're tasting the, the Americano uh, from vermouth right now, well, you'll have that gentian with that mid palate um, bitterness that's a bit like earthy. Uh, even some people talk about a flavor of radish, you know, uh, horseradish. It's interesting. And I, I, I think there's a bit of it definitely in it. And because the intensity of gentian is so strong, you, you will need to compensate with, with fruitiness and, and floral notes and, and sweetness. And that's what you get in all Americanos, whatever Americanos uh, you are going to have. Americanos can be white, they also can be red. If they are red, they are colored. It's not the natural color of the wine in general. There are exceptions to it. For example, the Rosa style of, of Coqui, if I'm not mistaken, is made with uh, rosé or red wine. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's very enjoyable to dr be drunk uh, the Italian way with soda or, or in spritzes. So when we're talking about cocktail, how should I serve this? I think really it's your call. It's, it's, it's an interesting ingredient for creating new cocktails, but in classic cocktails, it doesn't exist. Although a lot of bartenders have taken to use that style of, of aromatized wine instead of a product like Lilet in Vesper or, or, or uh, Corpse Revival number two. It makes for a very, very tasty cocktail, but I would resist from calling this uh, the authentic uh, style or uh, flavor. Uh, let's move to number five, uh, which is the Vino Amaro category. And I think Vino Amaro as a category doesn't really exist. Basically, it's what we, we are going to call in Italy bitter wines, aromatized wine with bitter ingredients that do not fit under any of the other umbrella. So they're not vermouth, they're not quinquinas, and they're not americanos. So what we call them, we call them bitter wines. 
Uh, the one we have, uh, I suggested, is, 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 is the Pasubio, which is a really, really interesting, interesting beast. It's really unique. Uh, you get pine notes. Uh, you get also a bit of smokiness, I think you will agree. But it's also made with berries, so you've got fruitiness that's not normally used in any other aromatized wine. It's, it's something completely unique uh, that was brought to the United States very recently that's slowly making its way to cocktail bars. And so again, it's a sort of aromatized wine that doesn't really have a star drink. Maybe you can invent it. Maybe this is, you are going to give a, a, a Vino Amaro its classic cocktail. Um, those style of products, Basically, there are really local Italian uh, uh, aromatized wine, really unique. Mostly, most of them really good. But of course, you, you get the dud from time to time. Most of them very good. Um, just stuff that used to be made uh, before all the other categories we mentioned so far got mainstream. Then you would drink this because that was made in your village. And then uh, obviously because everything got standardized, they disappeared and some uh, importers are now rediscovering that stuff and bringing it to other markets and hopefully it will survive uh, because this is a really interesting and delightful style of, 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 uh, of aromatized wine, I think. Good. Now maybe we can uh, move on because we, we have maybe what, 10 minutes left? We don't have a lot of time left, I think. Um, let, let's move on to uh, our last uh, our last tasting. Um, for lack of a better way to define them, I, I call those New World Aromatized Wine. But if you have the one I suggested with the Cabaret Tif, that's not from the New World. It's, it's actually from South Af Africa. Um, also suggested having going for Ancouth, uh, the, uh, I think from New York State. But uh, a lot of, 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 of the modern, new-style American vermouth uh, would fall into that, into that uh, category because uh, that's, I'm, I'm reaching maybe the political part of this uh, seminar uh, because obviously if we're talking about aromatized wine, uh, we need to talk about everything that's going on in the aromatized world. world. And a lot of the uh, uh, American vermouth brands that have appeared on the market recently don't have wormwood. So in Europe, we wouldn't call those products Vermouth, but because the legislation in the US is not strict at all on what can be called vermouth, basically the legislation says in a very, I don't know, it's almost poetic. Uh, vermouth is something that uh, smells like vermouth, looks like vermouth, tastes like vermouth. So basically it's whatever you want it to be. Um, a lot of producers have called their aromatized wine vermouth, probably because it sells better that way. Uh, but, but what they are, are uh, a new style of aromatized wine. And some of them is excellent. It is not by no mean a criticism of those New World American vermouth. Uh, it's just that we in Europe would not consider it uh, vermouth. And I think it's important that uh, consumers know that this is not a traditional vermouth, that you can't use them and swap them for a Martini Rosso uh, in, in your Manhattan. It doesn't work that way, right? But still, it's ex extremely interesting because those style of aromatized wines have very little link with tradition. It's basically anything goes, and some of it is going to be excellent. Um, so is, is, is this the future of aromatized wine? Are we going to see uh, new styles emerge from there? I don't know. Uh, we will probably know in 20 years. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, but it is interesting. So if you're having, um, if you're having the Capri Teeth, it's going to remind you maybe of a quinquina because a Capri Teeth historically was a, a sort of quinquina produced in South Africa in the 20s. And it made its way to London and it made its way into, into, into the Savoy cocktail book. But it disappeared. And uh, some guys, uh, a South African winemaker and a Danish bartender, uh, decided to recreate it. But they recreated it without knowing what was in the original way, in the original Cabaret They just knew it was Kinkina and they just knew it was South African wine. And so they sort of came up with this completely uh, weird uh, aromatized wine, which will mix uh, Kinkina, South African wine, with local South African botanicals. And that's one of the big trends we see in aromatized wine world well now, is people creating completely new formula using the botanicals they have at hand, which is really interesting and ties in with a lot of, a lot of trends. If, 
for example, you, you went for uncouth, then I don't know which version you have. It changes every year. It's all about foraging and, and uh, finding in region, putting them together in that bottle. What I know is that you get something that has no sweetness or very little sweetness, and that's completely out there. Uh, it's it's very interesting experience. Some of them you, you I like, some of them I don't. It, it doesn't really matter. I, I think it's beyond liking or not liking. It's about uh, what you can you, what you can put into a bottle of aromatized wine, what you can make with it. So, so those, those, those products for me are really interesting and something you really need to keep an eye on. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so since this is a one-on-one, we've already talked about cocktails, but maybe we should uh, do a quick, short uh, history of, of, of aromatized wines and, and cocktails. Because, I mean, if we look at vermouth and even in a way uh, to quinquinas, it's... Uh, it, it's so obvious that those ingredients belong into a cocktail bar that we sort of lost view of it was not always that way. If, if you take the, uh, Jerry Thomas book from 1862, there was not a single vermouth cocktail in it. It was, I mean, you early cocktail bartenders didn't know anything about vermouth. It was discovered uh, a good 10 years later by, by, uh, by cocktail bartenders. And then in the 1880s, you have the Manhattan appearing, you have the Martinez, Martinis, and and, and by, by prohibition, uh, vermouth is actually the number one cocktail ingredient. It's a crazy, the success story of, of that particular aromatized wine in the cocktail world. Meanwhile, uh, as I was commenting earlier, quinquinas, uh, maybe because they were so connected to malaria, um, which was a typically European problem, uh, not a US problem, didn't make it into the cocktail world until extremely late. There were some country cocktails appearing in the 19, 1910s in the US, but they were mostly linked to the efforts of brands such as Dubonnet and Beer to, uh, to market themselves in the US, to try and find market opportunities. And they were like, yeah, this is like vermouth, only different. So mix it like vermouth. It's only until uh, cocktails got really popular. The golden age of cocktails in Europe is the 1920s, 1930s. So while uh, the US were, uh, going through prohibition. That's when cocktails grew in Europe. And that's when Kinkinas uh, made it onto the big, onto the big uh, stage. Um, but prohibition in the US and then the world war in Europe was also very problematic, especially the Second World War for all aromatized wine. It almost killed the trade. And so we have a huge decline from the 60s and 70s and we can see that in the type of cocktails that are invented or served into in bars you see aromatized wine almost disappearing i mean even even dry martini that 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 remain usually popular cocktail uh, you, you use less and less aromatized wine less and less removed in uh in 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 the dry martini thankfully then we have the cocktail renaissance which was all about uh, aromatized wine. It was one of the star ingredients of the cocktail re of the of the of the cocktail renaissance. So we have to be very grateful for that. And actually, most uh, aromatized wine producers would be nowhere today without uh, the cocktail renaissance. Because although in some countries in Europe uh, we have uh, still that culture, especially in Spain, of drinking the stuff on its own. Uh, in the rest of the world, it's it's slowly disappearing. Except if you're a big brand like Martini, uh, Martini and Rossi, uh, it's only it's really for most small brands. It's really only uh, only uh, cocktails, which uh, ties nicely with the last slide of my presentation and of the day. Uh, tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow with with aromatized wine in general? Uh, the driver is vermouth, and its category is growing five percent a year. So it's really, really, really good time to be into aromatized wine today. And aromatized wine in general will capitalize also on the trend towards low alcohol, towards day drinking. It's perfect style. Any aromatized wine goes really well with food. So, so I think we are really in the golden age uh, for, for aromatized wine and they will become more and more important, hopefully, in our drinking uh, culture. There are two problems though. One is, we barely touch upon it, is sugar. Because those uh, aromatized wines are made with bitter ingredients, you need to balance the bitterness, but also to give that full body to to all the, the, the to most of the, the the aromatized wine we tasted. You need sugar, and there can be a lot of sugar into it. We could we can talk about. I mean, it can go from 100 grams to 200, or even more in some cases, grams of sugar, which is a lot, and people are very worried about sugars, which is why 
if you had uncouth, if you had capillary teeth, you'll note the last, uh, the last, the last one, the last aromatized wine we tasted. You'll know there's a lot, a lot less sugar, and that can be a problem for some because there's a, a thinness. We are lacking body, but it's also a reaction to where the marketplace is. There is a problem with sugar, and uh, I think it's a problem that producers will have to solve. And it, it is not an easy problem. Maybe if we had more time, we'll discuss more about it. Unfortunately, it's it's already uh, we're we're closing in in on the hour. And another problem, and that's why that was really interesting, I think, to do this, this seminar, is that at the end of the day, most people, when we're talking about aromatized wine, what they have in mind is vermouth. And vermouth is the number one player. It's the driver of the category. And unless we have more education and more knowledge of what aromatized wine is, vermouth is going to vaporize all those categories. And uh, that's one of the problems for growth. We will only use those products in drinks that are meant to be made uh, with vermouth and uh, all those other categories maybe will not get the attention they deserve. So maybe uh, after this seminar, you will uh, give more attention to, to all those other aromatized wine. Um, I at least uh, hope that uh, this was interesting and uh, that you've learned a little bit about where those wines come from and what you can do with them. And I thank you for uh, joining us uh, today. It was certainly a weird one to do this online. Hope it was okay. And um, uh, most of all, I hope to see you all next year at Tales of the Cocktail, this time, hopefully, uh, in the flesh in New Orleans. So goodbye and uh, see you next time.